Welcome to another edition of the Empower LA podcast, the podcast where we discuss all things neighborhood council with the people who live, work, and play in the city of LA. This is your host, Brett Shears from the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Our guest today is the always affable Los Angeles City Controller, Ron Galperin. In addition to being the first person from the Neighborhood Council system to be elected to citywide office, Ron is well known for being one of the system's greatest advocates. In our conversation, Ron talks about his journey from being an active Neighborhood Council board member to City Controller. I got started on all of this through my Neighborhood Council. How you can use your passion to create your own opportunities for service. If a commission doesn't exist, to actually do what you want to do, go out and create it. How to build successful relationships with the elected officials and their staffs. Sometimes just picking up the phone or sending an email or having an email exchange can help you develop those relationships. And a whole host of other interesting things. So sit back, try to control yourself, and enjoy the podcast. Tell everyone your name and title. I'm Ron Galperin, Los Angeles City Controller. Ron, thank you so much for coming to the Empower LA podcast. I'm really excited to have you. Um, before we dive into everything, uh, can you tell us a little bit about you know, who you are, where you're from, how you got to this point in your career? Sure. Well, uh, I'm Controller of the City of LA, which sometimes I wonder if it's the most deceptive title of all of the elected officials. I don't get to control everything, but I'm working on it. And uh, it is my job to keep the finances of the city in control. Uh, or at least to keep them from going out of control. Right. And I am now in my second term in that job, and I'm really fortunate to do something that I love each and every single day. I got started on all of this actually through my neighborhood council. And uh, when I first moved into the neighborhood that I live in right now, I uh, wanted to meet some of the neighbors. And we got together and we actually created a neighborhood association, which didn't exist before. And then we wanted to know, well, who else is out there? <laughs> and got familiar with the neighborhood council, went to a couple meetings, got hooked, then ended up on the board of the neighborhood council. And one thing sort of led to another. And in the process, I got really interested in where our money was coming from, where it was going, why we didn't have money to do some of the most basic things we needed to do. And uh, today, I'm serving as controller. And you had a lot of, you know, opportunities in between as commissioner, you know, for different things having to do with budget and finances. How did those opportunities come along? Because like you said, you served the neighborhood council. I know there are a lot of ambitious board members out there. What, what was that process like? Well, first of all, I got involved as a neighborhood budget advocate right. and learned a lot about the city's budget, got to meet a lot of the leadership of the city. Uh, here are many of the challenges, many of the opportunities that were out there. And that led me to then run for city council, which did not work out the first time. But sometimes the things that don't work out actually really work out for the best. Mm -hmm. Because so much of what I was interested in when I was running then was the budget of the city. And it's one thing to want to repave our streets or to trim our trees or to increase public safety. But how do you do that if you don't have the finances of the city in order? Right. So after that uh, first race, uh, I ended up serving on two city commissions, one which was the Quality and Productivity Commission of the city at the time, where I really got to meet with all of the department managers and got to work with some great commissioners. And then there was the Commission on Revenue Efficiency, which was an ad hoc commission. It didn't exist. Uh, until we created it, and that was an opportunity to really reform collections in the city and to really dive into how we bring our money in and how it goes out. By the way, I think it's a great example that if a commission doesn't exist to actually do what you want to do, go out and create it, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we ended up doing, and it did some incredible work over a year and a half. Yeah, and no, I think a lot of people miss those opportunities, miss those options when they don't see them. It, that lack of creativity, I, I like that. I like that you all, just, let's make it happen. Well, sometimes you just have to make your own reality. Oh, wow. That's not a spin on alternative facts, is it? No, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. 
All right, so now you're you're in your second term as the city controller. Uh, for the people out there who don't really have a good sense of what the controller does and the day-to-day -day stuff, how did you describe the work you all do there? Besides controlling, of course, uh, what we do is, first of all, all the money that is paid out of the city for the salaries and for the benefits for our many employees, that comes through the controller's office. Yeah, you also, sign all of our paychecks. All by hand. <laughs> yes, of course. And also... All of the various payments that are made for the many vendors of the city, and you name it, by the way, we buy it. Yes, also, by do. the way, if you go onto our open data portal, you'll find every single item that we buy. And by the way, that data portal didn't exist when I first came into office. That was a real priority for me to open up the doors, the windows of the finances of the city for everybody to see. So we do that. I'm happy to talk a lot more about that. And also, we do the financial reporting for the city. We work with the departments in terms of the audits and the reports we do to really look at what's working, what's not, how do you make things work better. Mm -hmm. And we're really integral to just about everything that the city does. Sure, you have your hands in a lot of the city's pots, right? You bet. Um, so you are well known as the first person elected to citywide office who was also a neighborhood council board member. You talked about your time on there as a budget advocate. Do you? Can you recall your first time really participating in those neighborhood councils? You talked a little bit about it. What what was that like, what, you know, being a board member, doing the stuff that neighborhood councils do? I do remember that first time, actually. Uh, first of all, I was in touch with a couple of the folks who were already on the neighborhood council because they were giving us, in my neighborhood, great advice about how to go form a neighborhood association mm -hmm. because we hadn't done it before. Right. And their advice was really helpful. So one thing led to another, and I went to the first meeting, and I met some incredible people, heard about uh, the work that the Neighborhood Council was doing. The meeting was a little long, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, full of some really interesting facts and things happening. And I thought, ah, this is something that I'd like to get involved in. And then you did. So did you? Did, is there anything from that experience that you learned that really helped you get to where you are? It definitely provided opportunities, but any lessons, you know, either about the city, the government, or even just neighborhood councils? I think like anything else, it's what you decide to make of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be on a neighborhood council and just kind of show up. Right. Or you can be on a neighborhood council or any board for that matter and really get deeply involved and learn about the community and go out and make a difference and think out of the box and do things that haven't been done before. And I became outreach chair for the neighborhood council, which I thought was really key right. because it's one thing to go to meetings, but if the rest of the community doesn't know what you're doing and why you're important and why you're relevant, then you're not doing your job. Right. And yeah, I mean, you got to get the message out about neighborhood councils. You're going to have an effect, right? And to hear what is on people's minds and the agenda for what that neighborhood council does should really be reflective of that community. I would hope so. Um, so neighborhood councils, you know, often look to collaborate with various city departments or elected officials such as yourself. Do you think the process for engaging and collaborating with elected officials is or maybe should be different than departments? What what does it look like? What's the contrast? Is it the same? What does that collaboration look like? Sometimes that collaboration is about process, but sometimes it's just about initiative. I think that some of the more involved members of the neighborhood council or even just people in the community know that when you get to know some of your elected officials, when you get to know uh, the staffs, when you make phone calls, when you mm -hmm. send emails, mm -hmm. uh, when you send letters, when you come to events, you develop those relationships. Yes. And when you get to know various folks in departments throughout the city, that's the case as well. So part of it is about a process, but a lot of it is still about relationships, right? one to one. And the more people that you know, the more that you're able to actually have an impact. And there's not much difference in that regard, right, with departments or elected officials. Like this, the staffs are the staffs. They have these roles. And if you have relationships, it's going to help you out. Absolutely. Yeah. And we need that input. Mm -hmm. And we need the kind of oversight and the involvement that neighborhood councils are able to offer. It's really meant to be a check in many ways on the power right. of everybody else in the city and a voice that is really vital because, look, City Hall is a great place, but sometimes it's a box mm -hmm. like many other places, and it's a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And you need folks 
who have a different perspective, who can bring that to City Hall, and who can take those people who are in City Hall and bring them out into the community. That's right. Is there anything your office does in particular to engage neighborhood councils or anything maybe that you want to do, something down the, down the line? Well, I actually go to a lot of neighborhood councils, right. which I love to do, and it's a great way to meet people all over the city and to get to know our communities. Also, we are very involved with everything from Neighborhood Council Budget Day to the various educational programs that have been put on over the last couple of years mm -hmm. for neighborhood council members. Because, by the way, if you don't know what you're doing, then you're not able to be as effective right. in the role that you want to play. Uh, we particularly spend a bunch of time with neighborhood council budget advocates, of course, because that's our wheelhouse in the controller's office. Right. Yeah, is there anything else neighborhood councils should be doing to enhance these relationships? You talked about developing those as really a core you know, aspect of, of this kind of back and forth. Anything else in addition to that, developing those relationships with departments, offices, elected officials? I think you'd be surprised. Sometimes just picking up the phone or sending an email mm -hmm. or having an email exchange can help you develop those relationships. And it's not all that complicated necessarily. Right. You just do it <laughs> and you learn something in the process. And by the way, sometimes it may work out, sometimes it may not. But we learn from every single one of those experiences. And don't be discouraged because, you know, not everyone's time is infinite, right, capacity. So, Absolutely don't be discouraged. And some people are going to be more helpful at some times than others. That's always the case. But if you keep at it, then it yields results. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I wanted to get into, uh, you've looked at so-called idle funds that are sitting in a variety of special fund accounts. Um, that's been on and off and, you know, through different lenses, different aspects. But just to get down to the basics, what are special funds and why are some of them idle? Well, if you look at the city's treasury, it really will fluctuate during the course of the year depending upon when our money is coming in, when our money is coming out. And we'll have anywhere between about $6.5 billion to $11 billion, those are big bucks, yeah. that are in the city's treasury. But everybody's heard of the term general fund, mm -hmm. but the reality is that maybe only about 15% of the money at any given moment in time is in the general fund. The rest of it is in more than 800 special funds. And there's a special fund for everything you could possibly imagine. Some of them are in the hundreds of millions of dollars for transportation or bond funds or for parks funds. Right. Uh, some of them are for public safety. Some of them are really specific uh, for the purposes of, let's say, horses in the park, mm -hmm. or they may be for the trimming of particular kind of trees in very specific locations. But the way this has come to be is that sometimes there's the best of intentions. Let's create a fund that can only be used for one specific purpose. Right. But the problem with that is that then you end up with so many funds and your money is locked away in many ways in so many of these funds that make them tough to spend. This has become a real obsession for me because if we can make those funds more usable, we're already collecting them, mm -hmm. then we can actually achieve a much greater result. So I looked at 130 funds, which shockingly had not had any spending out of them for a period of about four years or more. Mm. Now these totaled about $28 million, and that means that the money was just sitting there unspent. I've now been working with the council, with the mayor, to actually get that money spent. And we don't want to spend it just for the sake of spending right, it, right. but for the use that it was actually meant to be put to. And we're creating a whole new set of rules. We're working with departments so that they will actually spend that. And by the way, that $28 million is the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. because we have other funds in which there's been some spending, but a lot less than what is coming in. And we want to really have a holistic change in how we deal with these funds. And that will help actually yield some great results in terms of being able to put that money to good use. Well, how do these funds come about and, and who is the money coming from? You know, what who's being taxed or whatever the term is? So these terms. funds have many different sources. Some of them may have been from a specific grant source. Some of them may have been set aside by the council. Some of them may be from a specific tax or a specific fee mm. or some other specific source. 
Uh, some of them come from a variety of different sources. But when you take all the money and you break it up into so many different accounts, you want to make sure, of course, that money doesn't go astray and get spent for something it wasn't supposed to be spent for. Right. But you can end up with kind of a crazy situation. I remember one of the first audits that I did was for the 1% for art fee in the city. And for large developments, developers will actually do that art on their own site. But mm -hmm. for smaller ones, they pay into the fund. So about $10 million was sitting there, and it was unspent. Why? Because somebody a while ago thought that it was a good idea to create a rule that the money could only be spent within one block of where it was collected. Right. So we collected $100 here and $200 there and $500 there. Imagine trying to spend that, not to mention the accounting nightmare. Mm -hmm. So I worked with the city attorney's office to change those rules, and now that money has actually been put to use as it was intended for great art projects. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about, you know, you worked with the city attorney about certain restrictions. What should the city be doing with these? Is there any advocacy role here for neighborhood councils to encourage, you know, some policy options? Uh, should they be getting in touch with their council members to encourage them to, you know, maybe change certain rules or whatever guidelines for these funds? Well, there's a lot of proposals that we've made, and uh, we've also been convening working groups with each of the departments, and we're going to be issuing a whole set of uh, new guidelines. But some of that is when you create a fund, you shouldn't make it too restrictive. Right. When uh, you create a fund, it should have an expiration date. Mm -hmm. It can be extended, but there should be an expiration date. There should be provisions that if the money can't get spent for something, for example, let's say there's a so-called encumbrance where the department says we're gonna set aside money for project, but then if that project ends up not happening mm. and that encumbrance still sits there, that means you can't spend the money but we can fix that. Mm -hmm. And also, when some of these funds get created, it sounds good to say we're only going to spend it for one purpose, but then sometimes that has some real consequences further down the line, and we got to think holistically about it. And are a lot of these policies kind of going to be going forward on future funds, and it may not necessarily reflect on those well we're working forensically on each and every one of these funds and some of the rules are going to change going backwards where that's possible some of them are going to be changed going forward it depends on the fund how it was created what the rules are by the way we have each and every single one of these funds online on our website along with what is the balance what's the cash balance how much of it is committed how much of it is uncommitted who is the one person in the city whose name is attached to that fund and their phone number and their email and details of what that fund can and can't be used for. And by the way, it is a great tool for neighbor council board members because if you go to your council member and you say, well, we'd like to see an improvement in the park, yes, it yes. sounds great. Yeah. But that council member may say, well, that's great, but we don't have the money for it. But imagine if you go into that office and you say, we'd like to see this improvement. And by the way, fund number X mm -hmm. has a balance of such and such, and so much of it is uncommitted. And it says under the rules it can be used for this purpose. Mm -hmm. How about it? Mm -hmm. Boy, does that change your empowerment. So that's an advocacy role for neighborhood councils. Empower themselves with that data to actually leverage it. To You bet. Yeah. Oh. Well, so speaking of data... Uh, I think it's fair to say that you have been a leader in this effort to open up the city's data. It's wide open now. There's lots of data out there. But why is it so important to make this data available to the public? What What's the point of this all? Well, first of all, the money of the city and the operations of the city, they all belong to you, the people who live in this city. And I believe that everybody has a right to that information. Now, not everybody's going to check out every detail of it every right. minute of every day. But the fact that it's out there, I think sunshine is the best disinfectant, <laughs> as they say. And having an open government creates a lot more accountability, a lot more honesty, a lot more engagement, uh, a lot more efficiency. And by the way, the fact that it's out there doesn't guarantee those things, right. but it helps to really enhance it. And I've seen a lot of changes that have come about in the city. And by the way, in other places that have really embraced a culture of openness and a culture of what I would call radical transparency. Mm -hmm. Let's put it all out there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's going to have some warts, and that's okay. Right. How else 
can we expect to get better if we don't put it out there for everybody to see? Yeah, that, that conversation about data has long been started. You definitely helped start and facilitated that. So I think there's a great value in that. But with the data itself, does the data show anything like inequities? Does it show, does it reveal something, you know, whether that's based on someone's or the city's geography or a certain group versus another one? Um, is there anything like that in the data? Well, data is just data in and of itself. Uh -huh. But the question is how you take that and you can turn it into maps, mm -hmm. which tell you an awful lot. You can turn it into all sorts of visualizations. You also can involve various members of the community or data scientists to really kind of compare information so that you begin to learn some lessons there. Right. We've sought to do a lot of mapping around a lot of issues because it's one thing to look at a spreadsheet. Eh, not that exciting. Right. But if you look at it in a map form, if you look at it in an infographic form, if you tell a story with it, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it comes to life. That's the journalist in you. You forgot to mention your your career background all before this public service. Well, before uh, becoming controller of the city of L.A., I had a number of careers, uh, but uh, I was a journalist for quite a number of years uh, at the uh, L.A. Business Journal. I was an editor and a writer. I was also a columnist for the L.A. Times for quite a number of years. And that ability to ask questions and to have no compunction about asking those questions, <laughs> to see what you can learn from it, the ability to communicate what you've learned, I think is really helpful in what I do. And then I was also an attorney, and I did quite a number of depositions, and the ability to ask questions, mm -hmm. and again, the ability to communicate what you find out, and also look at some of the details where both the, uh, the devils are, as well as some of the angels, mm -hmm. makes a big difference in what I do today. You talked about the relationship to the data of the special funds and, and you know the advocacy role for neighborhood councils, maybe how they can leverage that data. But if they come across you know this data and someone has mapped it out, visualized it, and they discover some inequity, how can neighborhood councils use that information, that data, your portal, to really be proactive about making sure their communities get their fair share? Well, every community, of course, wants their fair share, and how you define fair share really kind of depends sure. on so many different factors. Uh, different parts of the city have different needs when it comes to law enforcement, right. and that may be based on where that community is or what the density is or so many other factors. Right. So how do we define what fair share really is? But that's where the role of an advocate in the community really comes in to cool. argue for what you think is really in the best interest of the community. And by the way, the community may sometimes be in agreement on what that is, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. But the more people that you have in the mix, the more you actually begin to really get a sense of what the needs are in a particular community. But having that information and being armed with it makes all the difference in terms of being effective versus just kind of blowing smoke. Yeah. <laughs> So we are the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. You know, that's our name. And I don't know how for how much longer. I mean, I, I think we will be that for a while. But what is that word? You're in the charter. We are in the charter right now. So we're going to, you know, we'll have to revisit a change if that's possible. But uh, what does that word, empowerment, what does it mean to you? You talked about some of it, but what does it really mean? Empowerment means the ability to really make a difference. And that difference can be made through City Hall. It can be made through partnering with lots of other organizations. It can be made by just getting to know your neighbors. And it also can be made, and I think a real prerequisite, is getting informed. And I really urge people who are interested in being on a neighborhood council and people who are to soak up and absorb as much information as you possibly can about this city. It's an amazing place that we live in mm -hmm. and incredibly complex. Some things are not necessarily as they appear to be. And the more that you learn about them, the deeper your understanding and the deeper your ability to actually make a difference. And that's in the final analysis what we all want to do. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Life is short. Yeah. And how do you make the biggest difference in the lives of people around you? Before we go... 
Uh, did you have any final thoughts about neighborhood councils? You've been such a big part of the system, and now you're in this position where you can really advocate for them. You're in a role where uh, you can engage them and uplift them and talk about empowerment. Do you have any wisdom for neighborhood councils? Do you have any uh, people who aspire to make a difference, as you are saying? Well, a couple things. One is just go for it, uh, not wait for somebody else to come to you, mm -hmm. but sometimes just go do it and follow what your passion is. There are people who are in neighborhood councils who care about land use. There are people who care deeply about issues of homelessness. There are those who care about community gardens or about transportation issues. And it is the mix of all these people coming together that are what creating community is all about. Take your passion and learn as much as you can, share as much as you can, do as much as you can. Well, thank you for that sentiment. Before we go, did you have anything you wanted to plug, anything that's on the horizon that maybe the portal, what new website, anything that, you know? Well, if you haven't checked out LAController.org, you will find a lot of information about the city. You'll find our virtual checkbook, every single payment that is made, details of payroll for everybody who works for the city. You'll find all sorts of statistics, all sorts of metrics about how many street miles are being repaved, how many parking tickets, and where they're given out. We've mapped them all. You will find information about public safety. You will find every single item that we purchase, who we bought it from, and what we paid for it. All sorts of things that you've maybe always wanted to know about, some things maybe you didn't even know you wanted to know about, but can learn about your city. And so I really welcome everybody to check us out. All right. Thank you so much for your time, City Controller Ron Galperin. Thank you for being a great voice for the Neighborhood Council System and, and an advocate for us. And thank you, Dunn, and thank you for all the great work you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Empower LA podcast. As always, you can learn more about the Neighborhood Council System at EmpowerLA.org, where you can find information about all the neighborhood councils that make the city of LA a better place. You can also check out our show notes for the episode if you want to learn a bit more about the topics we discussed. The Empower LA podcast is available in a variety of formats for all your listening needs. If you are so inclined, please leave us a review so we can get the word out about neighborhood councils. Thank you so much for your support.